A rose between two thorns. Wow. Uh, well, hello. Happy New Year to those of you. <laughs> no one knows who you were referring to. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to those of you uh, that I haven't seen yet. Happy New Year. I just have one item at the top. Uh, we are greatly concerned by reports that human rights activist Raith Badawi will start facing the inhumane punishment of a thousand lashes in addition to serving a 10-year sentence in prison for exercising his rights to freedom of expression and religion. The United States government calls on Saudi authorities to cancel this brutal punishment and to review Badawi's case and sentence. The United States strongly opposes laws, including apostasy laws that restrict the exercise of these freedoms and urges all countries to uphold these rights in practice. I also just want to flag, I have a time uh, issue on the back end here, so let's get to any as many issues as we possibly can. Go ahead, Matt. Um, okay, well, I was going to ask about that, what you just talked about. Okay. Anyway, so let's start um, there. Just uh, what happens if the Saudis go ahead and, and do this? Well, Matt, obviously we've expressed our views. Uh, this announcement just came out this morning. Uh, we've certainly uh, expressed our views privately. I'm not going to get into a discussion about uh, what happens next. Obviously, we're just making clear our opposition to this. Does the administration oppose public flogging as a punishment for any crime or just for uh, religious type? Issues. Well, you know our view on religious freedom and people's ability to express religious freedom, um, so I would focus on that. Well, no, I mean, do you think that, does the administration believe that there are certain crimes that it's, accept, that it's acceptable to be punished by being publicly flogged? I think we've expressed in the past in a range of reports we do annually, Matt, what our views are. I don't think I need to expose on those any further. And just one thing mm -hmm. you said to you, want them to cancel this sentence, correct? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean you believe the individual deserves any kind of a sentence? We said to review his case and sentence. So obviously there's a judicial process, but I, uh, but clearly we want to cancel this particular sentence, yes. Okay. Uh, should we move on to another? You mean nullify, right? I mean, it just... Yes, just that's just another way of saying it, okay. sure. Should we move on to a new topic? Uh, Go ahead, James. Staying with human, oh. Well, staying with human okay. rights, uh, there's... Um, the uh, late report out of the Washington Post about the family of the Radio Free Asia reporter who are uh, being harassed by Chinese authorities in Xinjiang province. Uh, do you have a comment on what's been happening to uh, this reporter's brothers? We consistently raise the treatment of journalists and ethnic and religious minorities with the Chinese government at all levels. We're deeply concerned by reports that family members of the Radio Free Asia journalist Sharet Hashor continue to be harassed, including reports that his brothers have been imprisoned, apparently in retribution, for his reporting. We urge Chinese authorities to cease harassment of his family and to treat them fairly and with dig dignity. We continually urge China to respect internationally recognized human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression. Have, have you discussed, you meaning the State <coughs> Department, has this building discussed his uh, brother's cases with the embassy here, with officials in Beijing? Um, what's beyond the public call for treating people fairly? We regularly raise concerns that we talk about publicly, privately, so you can assume we've done that. Go ahead. Can you uh, provide an update on what assistance the United States is providing France right now on counterterrorism and, well, this case particularly <clears throat> and in general? Uh, well, I don't have a significant update from yesterday. As I mentioned yesterday, as you know, we have a uh, we've had a long-standing uh, counterterrorism cooperation uh, with uh, France. That's been continuing. Uh, obviously, we've been that includes intel sharing. Uh, we've made clear, and the president's indicated this, as as has the secretary, that we will provide them any information or assistance uh, that they would like. Uh, but obviously, that's happening through diplomatic channels. I don't have any particular update beyond that. Do you know if um, there, there are two brothers who are now um, part of a, a quite a large manhunt in, Fr in northern France, suspected of being behind uh, the shooting yesterday at Charlie Hebdo? Do you know if these two brothers at all were known to uh, American intelligence authorities? Well, again, given this is an ongoing French investigation, we're going to let uh, them speak to uh, any specifics about suspects uh, and any additional efforts underway. Obviously, we share information privately, but there's nothing I'm going to get into at this point in time. Um, the um, Eric Holder has announced, or his office has announced, that he's going to go to Paris at the weekend. 
um, to join some uh, major talks on terrorism, which are being put together now by the French authorities. Um, I wondered if there were, given that we know the Secretary is off on the road soon, if there are any plans, perhaps, for the Secretary at some point to go to Paris. He's obviously been there a lot recently, mm -hmm. and it's a country and a city that he knows well. And whether there might be any plans, they haven't set the funerals yet, but whether he might anticipate attending any of the funerals that are held for the staff who were killed? I don't have any plans at this point in time. As you noted, obviously, these events are relatively fresh, and uh, clearly uh, we'll discuss that uh, once we know more details. And yesterday he was going to try and talk to uh, Foreign Minister he, Fabius. He did speak with Foreign Minister Fabius uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, and he expressed, of course, our condolences, which he'd already done publicly, but we certainly understood the Foreign Minister was uh, quite uh, busy yesterday uh, and certainly reiterated that the United States is here to offer any assistance that we can. Uh, Margaret? Jen, a uh, follow-on question Joe just asked there. Um, when it came comes to one of the suspects, Sharif uh, Kouachi, I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly, um, there are reports that he had ties to a known terrorist who would have been known to the U.S. since he was uh, confessed to conspiring to attack the U.S. Embassy in Paris. Uh, that man's name is Jamal Bagal um, and was a known associate. Um, is it safe to say that the U.S. would have uh, knowledge of his associates, given that they had focused on U.S. diplomatic facilities. As I reiterated, and I certainly understand the frustration with this, but this is, of course, a French investigation. We're sharing information privately. I'm just not going to be in a position to discuss or outline uh, any of that information sharing that's happening privately. Can you say whether there is uh, any connection, or perhaps there is none, between the attack in Yemen, the large scale? Uh, suicide attack yesterday and this attack in Paris. There are some making connections. Is there one? I know there are some making connections out there. Obviously, I'm not in a position to do that, and we're certainly going to let the investigation see itself through. Go ahead, James. Sometimes when a terrorist attack occurs on a Western target, the nature of the attack, its method of execution, etc., uh, will tell us something that, or show us something that tells us that, that there is something new afoot in the world of terrorism. In other words, some new capability, some, um, some new trend is evidenced by the way the attack unfolds or what have you. In this case, we happen to have the benefit of video footage of the attack, apparent purported video footage of the attack. Does this attack tell us anything new about terrorism uh, in, in, in the Western world right now, or is it, was it a fairly conventional attack? Uh, that really didn't show us anything new afoot in the world of terrorism? Well, James, I think those are all understandable and, and smart questions. Uh, we're just too preliminary in the process that, of course, the French have the lead on to do any public analysis of that. Certainly, you're right that it's the responsibility of any country, and certainly countries we work closely <coughs> with, to learn from uh, experiences, tragic incidents, as this was. Uh, but we're just not at that point of being able to do analysis in a public manner. Do we have more on this before we move on? Go ahead. Um, sort of piggybacking off of that, um, there are two kind of recurring topics that we're seeing here. You know, first is the indications that one or more or both of the brothers might have traveled to Syria in the last year. And secondly, the fact that they seem to have been um, taken some influence from social media and possibly from this Al-Qaeda publication Inspire. Is this kind of causing this building or any others in the, the administration to, to look at what more could be done to either... Um, stem the propaganda online or to coordinate more on the flow of foreign fighters? Well, uh, let me just say on this, in this specific case, as I've said a few times, but it's worth repeating again, the French have the lead on this investigation. We certainly understand that there is a great deal of speculation or interest or uh, educated analysis out there, but this is very fresh. It's very new. We're going to allow them to have the lead on this. We're going to share information privately. We're not going to speculate publicly on what things mean. Uh, as it relates to foreign fighters, which we don't know enough in this case, so let me preface that, uh, that's something that has been a focus that has picked up significantly, as you know, over the last six to nine months, uh, certainly given uh, events in the world. Uh, it's something that we work very closely with the French uh, and others around the world on. There's also an ongoing effort on um, that we've worked not just domestically, but also internationally on countering violent extremism. 
Uh, and obviously, this is something that we've done a lot on the federal level, but we've also, um, DHS and the State Department have also worked together with our international partners. Uh, we've had robust exchanges recently in the past few months with European government officials and community leaders from the UK, Germany, uh, and Scandinavia have had meetings to provide opportunities for us to share with our law enforcement and civil society counterparts overseas a better understanding of uh, the threat that communities face from extremist recruitment and activities. So there's a range of ongoing discussions that have been happening. And certainly, we look at and we learn from uh, tragic events that happen. And, and that's a part of the discussion as well. Should we move on to a new topic? Sure. Have you any update on the so-called mysterious 53? This, I don't think it's a mysterious 53, James, but well, they're uh, mysterious because no one will tell us who they are. Well, Arshad, as I've talked about a little bit in here on days where you weren't actually in attendance. Um, have we, you listed the names of the 53? We have not. And I, I talked so. about the reason we didn't list them, which was because we didn't want to put a target on their backs. The reason that we're focused on this is getting them released. Uh, so I will yeah, say. Probably. They already had a target on their backs. That's why they're in prison, right? Well, yes, Matt, but let me give you a little bit more information. Some have asked about how to categorize. The people on this list have been arrested for, uh, had been arrested for nonviolent activities that are protected uh, most other countries in the world. Uh, things that we know internationally are uh, respected and valued. Freedom of press, freedom of uh, protest. Um, that That is a uh, kind of was the focus of this list. As I mentioned a couple times, the Cuban government uh, made the commitment, uh, and ex we expect them to follow through on the release of all 53. Uh, the re there have been recent reports uh, that um, of a new release. I'm not going to confirm specific individuals on uh, any list. I can confirm that uh, this wasn't the first released release of people on the list, as some reports suggested. When you say this, what are you referring to? This wasn't the first release. What is this? There were some reports over the last 24 hours um, of a of the first release of uh, of individuals, um, and I'm just noting that that is not the first release of individuals on the list. So, are you telling us that there have been more than there has been more than one round of releases, as far as you know? That would be a, an accurate assumption. Yes. Okay. Is this building concern <coughs> by naming these people under detention that uh, they could be harmed by Cuban authorities? But Cuba knows it. Well, I think, Roz, that uh, this is a case where we – that one, this was not part of the negotiation. I think there's some confusion <clears throat> about that. This was a con commitment that the Cuban government made to release these individuals, a list we provided, and we fully expect them to do so. There were policy changes that the United States government also announced, regulations that we'll be putting in place through Commerce and the Treasury Department. So it was just a coincidence that these were all announced in a, one big batch by the president. They were, they were completely separate. I'm conveying, James, that I think not perhaps you, but some have been grouping together all of this. Yes, but yes. The president they, grouped them together in his own statement. In an announcement about a lot of things that are happening. But in the negotiation, that was about the swap of individuals. Um, to go back to your question, we made a judgment that the best way to secure the release of these individuals is to not name them publicly. We know who's on the list. The Cuban government has assured us that they're going to release these individuals. We're encouraging them to do that rapidly, and uh, we're confident what, they'll do that. What I don't get, what, though, what I don't understand about this is that if you know who's on the list and the Cubans know who's on the list, how is it, how, how would it hurt to have the names out there publicly so that the rest of the world can see whether or not the Cubans have lived up to their commitment or not. Well, Matt, that's not something we're doing at this well, point in time. I'm not it. ruling that out in the future. But at this point in time, we made a policy judgment. This was the right way to go about this. Well, then can you, can you say that once all 53 have, if and when all 53 are out, they'll, you, that you'll be in a position to name them and say, look, Here's proof that the Cubans lived up to their commitment. I'm not making any com new commitments at this point, Matt, but I'm just conveying that this is a list we know who's on the list. The Cubans know who's on the list. Uh, we're uh, certainly conveying right. to so complete if, that rapidly. So everybody knows who's on the list except for... The Associated Press. I understand your <laughs> no. frustration, but... I don't think it's just the AP. It's not, I mean, do the people who are on the list know that they're on the list? 
I think we've addressed that question have you? too. Can, I have. I mean, do the families of the people who do the families of people who are imprisoned who are on the list know that their loved one is on the list? Let me reiterate one thing that I said yesterday. Mean, Let me reiterate something I think that I said yesterday that I think is important here. There is a focus by all of you on this list of fifty-three. I understand that because it feels like a concrete thing that you're evaluating. This is one component. There are other, you there could be other, let me finish. There could be other arrests. If there are other arrests, we will make the case for those individuals to be released. This is not a the end. This is the beginning of a process. Right. But the problem is that we only have one after the release of Mr. Gross and the intelligence asset and the U.S. release of the three remaining Cuban five. The only thing that we have, or that the general that the general public or anybody else has, to know whether the Cubans are living up to their commitments to you and to the Pope, is whether these fifty three are out. And the only way for us to know that is to know who they are. That's not correct. What I was conveying before is that our agreement with the con Cubans was that we sought the release from a Cuban prison to the United States of a key U.S. intelligence asset who was exchanged for three Cuban intelligence right. agents jailed in the United States. Right. Separately, there was a component of uh, discussing policy changes that we were proposing. Right. The Cubans uh, committed to releasing 53 individuals. Right. There are a range of steps that we're going to take because we think it's in the interest of the United States. Right. There are regulations that will be put in place. It's in our interest to change our diplomatic relationship with the, with Cuba. Well, right. I, I don't think anyone's taking issue with, with the way you've laid that out. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that this is a, that, that you set the bar at 53 or a bar at 53 for the Cubans to show that they're meeting their commitment. And then you say you won't tell us whether or not they've actually met it or not. Well, one component, is, and I have told you that they have released some of them, that we are in con continuing to convey the need to release the rest as rapidly as possible. So Go ahead. Continuing on a mm -hmm. purely factual basis here. Sure. Um, you have told us just now that there have been at least two rounds of releases involving these 53 individuals. Um, can you tell us even ballpark numbers, uh, how many of those two releases amount to of the 53? Is it half? Or? I, I, I certainly understand your question. I'm just not going to get into specific um, numbers. When you say that there have been reports over the last 24 hours about uh, new releases uh, and that you're not going to get into confirming them or not, can we just for the sake of clarity uh, specify that you're referring to uh, um, the, the, the list of individuals, I think six, uh, that has been uh, published by the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba. Is that what we're talking well, about? Well, I'm not going to confirm who is on the list. Okay. What I was trying to do, and maybe not as clearly as I intended, was convey that some headlines suggested that this was the first release of, of individuals, and that is incorrect. Can you, can you explain the statement you made about you don't want to put a target on their backs? Who would use that, that, that as a target? I, I don't quite understand whose actions you might be fearing. Well, let me phrase it in a different way, Brad. Our objective and goal here is that these individuals get released. We have made mm -hmm. a policy judgment that it is in the interest of that not to release the list publicly in advance so of that. So you're worried that public pressure would actually harden the Cubans at I'm this point? I'm not going to spell it out more clearly. I understand the frustration of why you all would like to see the list, but we need to make a decision uh, about how to achieve our goal and not just how to uh, satisfy the desire to see the but list. I thought this wasn't your goal, actually. Wasn't this the Cubans who did this unilaterally? The Cubans did commit to this, yes but of course we'd like to see these individuals released. But, Did you share the list with any of the human rights organizations in Cuba who've been working for the releases of these people? I'm not going to get into more specifics there about is who is aware of, uh, of individuals on the list. There is some frustration from them that they feel that they've been uh, shut out of the process to a certain extent. Well, there are some opponents of the entire process of changing our approach to Cuba in Cuba and the United States. I'll but Jen, maybe that. those maybe those opponents would be a little less opposed if they knew what, whether or not the Cubans were meeting 
this commitment. There are individual uh, names that have been out there publicly, Matt, right. and I can assure you that the individual activists in Cuba know who those people are. But when it's, Treasury changes its regulations mm -hmm. on Cuba, is it considering doing that in a secret manner? No, that information will be released publicly, Brad, of course, you because made a businesses decision in that case, businesses so. need to be able to have the information and need to be able to know how to implement but it. But don't individuals need to have information too? It's an entirely different comparison. Can I just Go ask ahead. if you've set a date sure. yet for the migration talks? I have a topic? little more information on that. Uh, Assistant Secretary of State Roberta Jacobson will travel to Havana uh, on January 20, from January 21st to the 22nd, sorry, to take advantage of previously planned migration talks to launch a discussion with the Cuban government on normalization of diplomatic relations. As all of you know, the migration talks are a semi or semi annual meetings which alternate between the United States and Cuba. The United States hosted the last round in July 2014 in Washington, D.C. While the agenda for this round is not yet finalized, uh, the migration talks are bilateral efforts uh, to ensure safe, legal, and orderly migration between the United States and Cuba. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Assistant Secretary Jacobson will lead the delegation. Uh, of course, um, the decision to reestablish diplomatic relations is certainly going to be uh, a topic of that. And of course, issues surrounding that, including the reopening of embassies, requiring certain logistical arrangements, uh, embassy operations, staffing, visa issues would also be topics and as do well. Do you know how many people will be accompanying her in the American delegation? I don't have details on the delegation quite yet. I expect we will when we get a little bit closer and to the date. And do you know who her immediate sort of counterpart will be on the Cuban side? I will we'll let the Cubans convey that yeah, information. Yeah. For uh, the reestablishment of full relations between the two This countries. is just the beginning of having a discussion about these specific issues and obviously an opportunity to talk about some of the logistical details. So at this point, I'm not going to lay out a timeline. And Go so ahead. therefore, it would be unrealistic to imagine that an embassy might could conceivably even be reopened prior to the conclusion of these talks. I think that's correct, yes. Um, can I just uh, ask about um, the, 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 the process that uh, climaxed in the president's announcement, if you will, mm -hmm. um, with the talks in Canada and at the Vatican having been conducted chiefly by uh, Ben Rhodes and uh, Mr. Zuniga of the National Security mm -hmm. Council and not by uh, professional diplomats associated with this building that has given rise, as you may know, to some speculation uh, to the effect that the Secretary of State or the Department of State was essentially cut out of the loop on this big shift in Cuba policy. What would you say to that? I would disagree with that, with the fact that uh, Secretary Kerry uh, and others here were certainly consulting with everyone from the president on down on these ongoing negotiations and discussions. Can you and tell me that again, just so that we don't have a, the, the, the Christmas chimes in the back? Thank certainly. You. Uh, Secretary Kerry uh, and others were certainly consulting with uh, individuals involved in these negotiations and with the president on down uh, on these uh, this decision to reopen our diplomatic relations. And also, this has been a topic and a policy that the Secretary has long supported a change in. Right now, where our focus is, is on implementing this moving forward. And Secretary Kerry, Assistant Secretary Jay Kit Jacobson, will certainly be in the lead on that moving forward. So President Obama, Ben Rhodes, the White House National Security Council staff, were keeping John Kerry and his staff in the loop at all points along the way in this secret process. Yeah, there have been many discussions behind the scenes about these, uh, these, the ongoing negotiations. Was there a tactical decision in having <clears throat> people who might uh, be uh, best described as political operatives carrying out the work because there might it might have been easier to do so? Well, I think to be clear, um, Ricardo is a foreign service officer who has decades of experience uh, and just happens to be detailed over at the White House at this point in time. Ben Rhodes is one of the president's closest national security advisors, so I'd hardly characterize them in the way you did. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a decision made to uh, have these two individuals lead the talks. Obviously, there was a successful outcome. Uh, the secretary was supportive of that, certainly wanted to see a change in our relationship with Cuba and a change in our <coughs> policy approach. And our focus at this point in time is how we implement that moving forward. A well, successful let's outcome? Well, well, let, let me it's finish. Let yet. me finish. Yeah. Well, in it's, terms of an agreement on the swap of individuals, yes, that's a successful outcome. But to uh, contrast it with uh, the secretary's ongoing work with Mideast peace, with uh, going in every so often on the Iran nuclear talks, was there a tactical decision made to carry out something which the administration has long said it wanted to achieve without having so much public scrutiny 
ahead of it and possibly scuttling the uh, outcome that we have right well, now. Well, I think, Roz, to that question, and obviously it's better posed to the White House, but clearly there was a decision made to do these talks privately uh, in order to achieve the outcome, maybe is an overstated word, but to achieve a different path or a different way forward. And so that decision was made, uh, certainly so that it wouldn't have the ups and downs that public scrutiny often does. Well, can you just walk us through the, sure. the, the, the thinking that concludes that this is best conducted by two officials on the National Security Council and not by the diplomatic corps? Well, I think, James, it's important to remember that uh, the national security team works as a team, and there are negotiations the secretary leads. There are negotiations that sometimes the NSC uh, has more of a role on. There are, there are discussions that the Department of Defense leads on. We all work together and play different roles, and there are individuals who also span across different agencies. So this, is, uh, this was a process the secretary was comfortable with. We certainly are now focused on the path forward. And I'll leave it at that. I, just I, sure, I have to go in a few minutes here. Okay, go can ahead. I just make sure I understand that, that you're not expecting that the meeting that uh, Assistant Secretary Jacobson has on the 21st and 22nd is going to be the end of it. This is just the beginning of Correct. That is so the right way would, to think about you it. You would anticipate there would be additional meetings after that on the same on the normalization, not just on migration. That's right. I would anticipate it's going and, to be an ongoing process. And they would set it, I mean, like what, once a month or something they would meet? Or I, I don't know yet. I'm sure they'll discuss that as part of the meetings uh, when they're in Cuba. One more thing, I apologize. Sure, I've go said ahead. this at some point when That's I okay. haven't been here, but um, can you now or can you take the question of <clears throat> uh, when was the last visit to Havana. I actually, I have that do for you. you. I do. Um, of equal rank to Secretary or higher rank than Secretary uh, Jacobson. Sure. Well, the last visit, uh, so I don't know if this, I'm doing my best here to yeah, answer yeah. it. So uh, the highest ranking official from the Department of State to have visited Cuba on official travel in recent years was Roberta Jacobson when she was the principal deputy assistant secretary in 2011. Uh, since that time, Department of State practice has been to limit high-level visits to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State level. Before that, Craig Kelly, who was the PDAS before Roberto Jacobson, traveled in February 2010 when he was also Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. So yeah, no, the, but, but, then. but the real question, I think, is uh, this is the highest level U.S. visit since Thanks. when? We can certainly look can, into can that. You, I'm sure the seek, perhaps seek our, some information our, from the uh, our good Godfather friends in, in the there, historian's there, office. There, well, there, there, there is a, a school of thought that believes that a assistant secretary of state for Western Hemisphere um, visited in 1977. Okay, we will check on that. We'll, we'll seek uh, some help from our friends in the historian's office. Thank you. Jen, one yeah. quick question. Sure. Uh, the U.S. ambassador met with um, President Hadi today. I was wondering if you had anything, any kind of readout or attribution perhaps in a huge attack yesterday? Uh, I don't have a readout. We condemned the attack, as you may have seen yesterday, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, we can see if there's more we can convey about the ambassador's meeting. And the U.S. isn't ready to say it's AQAP yet, like the Yemenis have? We don't have any additional details or independently from this end. Uh, yeah. Let me just do a few more. Here. I have Go a quick on. one on Sri Lanka. The okay. elections were held today. Mm -hmm. There was a high turnout. Do you have anything to say on that? Sure. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. I know I have something a little new on this. Let me just, oops, sorry about that. All right, here we go, Well, it. <clears throat> uh, we are encouraged by initial reports indicating high turnout. We're further heartened by reports that election observers have thus far been able to carry out their critical oversight role. We commend the role of the Election Commission and police and security forces in ensuring a peaceful process. We urge the government of Sri Lanka to ensure that vote counting is carried out credibly and transparently and that any allegation of fraud or violence is credibly investigated. Uh, we will wait to hear the announcement of the Electoral Commission and the reports from domestic and international observer groups before making an assessment of the voting process. And I know you asked yesterday about yeah. observers from here. The United States did not send international election monitors for the presidential elections in Sri Lanka. We understand the government of Sri Lanka invited international monitors from the Commonwealth South, <coughs> Asian, uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation and the Asian Network for Free and Fair Elections, totaling around 84 international 
uh, monitors. Pam? Oh, go ahead. Sri Lanka? Or no, 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 but in okay. the region. Okay. It's, there, there's a uh, <clears throat> there's a report in the Pakistan newspaper, the Tribune, mm -hmm. which uh, asserts that the United States has double counted funds spent prior to the enactment of Kerry Luger Berman uh, as falling under the 7.5 billion to be dispersed to Pakistan under Kerry Luger Berman. Is that true? Are you counting any funds that were expended prior to the passage of that bill or that law now as part of the uh, uh, 7.5 billion? I'll have to take that, Arshad, okay. which Thank I'm sure you. doesn't surprise you, but we can look into it with our Excellent. with our economic team. Go ahead, Pam. Jim, can you elaborate on a U.S. travel advisory that was issued over the weekend for Surabaya, Indonesia? Sure. It stated that the embassy was aware of potential threats against U.S. associated hotels and banks. Um, does this have anything to do with the um, Air Asia crash? You know, that flight, of course, took off from that city. And secondly, today, the Indonesian foreign minister said that security officials had assured her there were no threats of any kind and the situation is safe. <laughs> Well, uh, the, the embassy, as you noted, uh, in Jakarta released a security message on January 3rd, uh, which alerted U.S. citizens to a potential threat against U.S.-associated banks and hotels in Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, it strongly encouraged U.S. citizens who are traveling or living abroad to, uh, of course, enroll in the Smart Traveler program and, and uh, keep wary of our or keep uh, aware of our uh, security messages. We have no knowledge of any connection between this threat and the Air Asia flight. So this was a separate, um, separate information that we wanted to put out to the public. There, as you know, we have information we gather through a range of sources, and we provide that publicly when warranted. This is the case here too, as well. Can I just ask on Iran. Sure. Um, you put out a statement earlier this morning that uh, Under Secretary Sherman mm -hmm. is going to Geneva on. Um, um, the 15th of January through the 17th. Yes. And the European Union has announced the start of the P5 plus one talks on the 18th. Mm -hmm. I just wanted um, two days ahead for bilateral talks. Usually you only give yourself like a new union you do a day. Was there a particular reason? It depends. Reason? It's different time to time. I think there was a decision made that um, that was warranted now and it gives an opportunity to have more discussion. And um, that's, of course, why uh, uh, Acting Deputy Secretary Sherman will be leading and, and heading to these uh, meetings. Okay, so there's no particular reason for two days of talks as opposed to? I wouldn't overread into it other than our commitment to having the discussions about the technical details and uh, continuing to make progress. And do you anticipate these political director level, level talks will go on through January? How is it going to work? I expect that once they have this round of discussions, they'll have they'll make determinations about the schedule moving forward. As always, we'll let the EU make announcements about the next sets of meetings. But you want an outline <clears throat> by March. Yes, but uh, in terms of the specific sets of meetings, I expect the meetings will be continuous if they have been, or regular. And there are technical meetings often that happen in between, <clears throat> but in terms of a schedule, well, we're just not at that point yet. I've got three. I'll make them really, really Okay, brief. and then we'll do the Bahrain, last one. Go ahead. Is, do you have any updates on the, on the, on the case of, uh, uh, on your concerns about the, the case of Mr. Salman? Uh, let me see if I have anything new on that. If not, Matt, we can look into and it. And there's certainly. also a question about arms sales to Bahrain, if they've fully resumed or not. So if you could take that. Secondly, sure, I'm happy um, to take both of those. Turkey, the Turkish foreign minister has said that the leader, political leader of Hamas, Khalid Mishal, is welcome mm -hmm. in Turkey anytime he wants to, um, anytime he wants to go. Do you have any um, thoughts about that? Given I, the fact that he I is, spoke to this a little you know, bit um, yesterday, but it wasn't asked in the exact same way. Uh, our position on Hamas has not changed. Hamas is a designated foreign terrorist organization that continues to engage in terrorist activity and demonstrate its intentions during the summer's conflict in, with Israel. We continue to raise our concerns about the relationship between Hamas and Turkey with senior Turkish officials, including after learning of Michelle's recent visit there. And we have urged the government of Turkey to press Hamas to reduce tensions and prevent violence. Well, I mean, who, who, is there any, I mean, I don't get it. This guy is the leader of a terrorist organization. If, if, if uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri showed up in Turkey, would you have the, have a similar muted response to, I mean. I, I don't think that's a muted response. Obviously, we look well, at each situation. This is a NATO ally, case. and they seem to be, yes. they were hosting and seem to be, willing and happy to host the leader of a group that you deem a foreign terrorist organization. So is there is Hamas somehow less bad than other 
uh, other groups that are on the FTO list? I just conveyed we expressed our concern. We'll continue to have that discussion. Can I, can I ask this in a different way, slight like other side of the coin? Uh, could the, uh, the hosting of somebody like Khalid Mashal uh, place Turkey uh, in some jeopardy of finding itself on the, the list of nations that sponsor state terrorism? or states that sponsor terrorism? Rather. I wouldn't jump to that conclusion. Obviously, there are a range of criteria that are looked at in that regard. Uh, so, I mean, I you remember the famous Bush doctrine, if you clothe, feed, or harbor a terrorist, you are a terrorist. Does that doctrine still hold? Well, I don't think we've repeated that exactly. Uh, there's obviously criteria that we look at as it relates to designating countries or individuals. We're not looking at that as it relates to well, Turkey. Obviously, we're concerned about this. Well, welcoming the leader of a group that you designated a foreign terrorist organization would certainly seem to be supporting it. Well, Matt, obviously well, we've expressed our concerns. There, there is, hasn't been action that we have knowledge of to confirm about where his whereabouts are. Well, but you so, just said that you knew that, that you raised your concerns with him when you found out that he was there. A couple that he of, recently visited. Yes, we did. Yeah, but I mean, so that, 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 that's it? It's okay? I don't think I said it was okay. Well, Pam, no, I know that there isn't any consequence then, except for you saying that we're concerned about I, it. I, right. We're going to have just private discussions. Right. We have Am to I, wrap this up. Oh, I got one more. It'll okay. Be, it'll be brief. And that is that I, I read the um, taking question they put out on the, mm -hmm. it's a fuller explanation of your position on yes. the Palestinians and the ICC. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, in any of this, which you, I, um, this is your opinion that the U.S., you don't believe the Palestinians are eligible to join, but is there anything that the United States can do to stop the Palestinians from from doing this? I mean, opinions are like noses, right? You know, everyone's got one. But does this one, does your opinion on this make any difference? Well, I don't think it's a appropriate member? for me to do the analysis of what influence our opinion has, Matt. You can ask other people that question. Right. And there are some unfortunate people without noses. Well, I suppose. But that is true. It's a Most people question. are born with them. Anyway, the, the, in addition to submitting, the, the, well, the, the deal is that the ICC has welcomed them as the 123rd member state of the court, of the, of the statute of Rome, whether you think well, that, they, that they're eligible or Matt, not. They, there is, they, there is, there is documents at... that are submitted to uh, Ban Ki-moon. There is a decision that will be made by member organizations. I don't, I don't think that's an accurate interpretation well, of where things stand. I think the decision has already been made. I mean, the letter from the president of the court to President Abbas says that, you know, I confirm receipt and here you're, and basically you're in. And then he also says that they confirm receipt that the, of, of a letter that the Palestinians have sent to them, giving the ICC jurisdiction back to June, just before the Gaza uh, war, uh, back to June of 2014. Do you have any opinion about that? And if even if you do, does it make any difference? Well, let us take a closer look at that, because that's not my understanding of where the status of where things are at this right. point in the decision making. OK, last one. Go ahead. OK, so this just popped up, so you may not have a response mm -hmm. at this point. But there's reports that a 25 year old American student was stabbed in Jerusalem uh, and wounded um, from that attack. Are, is this something that you have any comments on, or are you in touch with the Israelis about this particular case? We didn't have more information. We didn't have an indication. Obviously, this just happened. That there there was an American citizen involved, so uh, we will take a closer look at it and see if we can get more information. Thanks, everyone.